Well, I'm really pleased to be with you here uh, this afternoon. Um, you know, I had the, uh, when I uh, received the invitation, uh, David sent me the address. And wasn't I surprised to see it was a Racino. And <laughs> walked by the front doors and they automatically opened and there were 150,000 slot machines sitting there. <laughs> Counties are moving up in the world here. <laughs> or maybe it's a symbol, right? I know the farmers would recognize that kind of gambling in the, the business that they do. And, uh, Perhaps uh, uh, that's true of counties, too. Wasn't it a pleasure to listen to somebody, uh, two people up here, who really knew the answers to the questions that you have? That is, that is always so refreshing. And uh, now I'm here. I'm going to talk about some of the, uh, uh, some of the uh, changes that have been made and are coming up on, on finance. So we're going to talk about dollars. Uh, since we're moving forward, this means that an awful lot of what we'll be saying will be speculating about what might happen because we're always trying to anticipate what happens with dollars and revenues and that sort of thing. And we're always anticipating incorrectly. That's the, the nature of the business. But I hope we can give you some idea of what the changes are, what's going to happen to the money. Uh, we're going to look in particular at uh, House Enrolled Act 1001, which uh, was one of the Rhodes bills, the big Rhodes bill. Senate Enrolled Act 67, which was uh, another roads bill, the local funding roads, and the one that also dealt with the uh, local option income tax balances. And then Senate Enrolled Act 308, which is the farmland assessment changes. Uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll deal with a couple of other uh, local uh, income tax issues uh, as well as we go forward. Well, let's start, start uh, with uh, road funding and talk a little bit about what's in House Enrolled Act 1001. Now, I suspect you've heard a lot about this already. Uh, but I've got the numbers attached up here. I'll show you a couple of pictures to show you what uh, uh, the state has in mind here. Uh, but what 1001 does is uh, it's actually a, a response to a problem that I know you're aware of and uh, a problem that the county association, cities and towns have been working on for quite some time, and that is road funding. And uh, as you know, uh, road funding uh, has, uh, has not been keeping up with costs uh, for the last, probably since the, uh, the beginning of the millennium. Uh, and uh, for several reasons, uh, we had uh, a, a slow uh, expansion in the double O's. We've had a slow expansion uh, since the end of the recession, and we had the recession. That drove down revenue, or drove down incomes, that drove down business, it drove down auto sales meaning people weren't buying as much gasoline, as much diesel fuel, and that reduced the uh, revenues from the uh, motor vehicle, uh, gasoline, and uh, uh, diesel fuel taxes. Uh, up until about a year and a half ago, we had uh, actually historically high gasoline and diesel fuel prices. And that discourages people from buying as well. They look for alternatives uh, to driving when that, that's the case. And then as we know, and going forward, this is the, the long run problem for, for road funding. We've got the problem of fuel efficiency. What's well, the problem of fuel efficiency from the point of view of road construction and road funding? Uh, it's a terrific thing from many other points of view, uh, but uh, as uh, automobiles become more fuel efficient, as we get the hybrids, as we step forward into the uh, uh, alternative energy cars, the, the electric cars, fuel efficiency grows, automobiles and trucks buy less gasoline, and we get less revenue for roads. And so we have this problem. And uh, county association, cities and towns, we're in there telling the legislature this is a real problem. Finally, INDOT got in there and said, you know, this is, in fact, a real problem. And the legislature acted. And they did a number of things. Now, uh, originally, you may have remembered uh, at the beginning of the session, there were, some, there were a couple of very ambitious plans. Uh, the governor had a plan, and the House uh, leadership had a plan. And uh, neither of those plans passed. Uh, instead, we kicked the can down the road but just for one year, and as a stopgap, came up with revenues, about a billion dollars, actually, uh, to add to road funding, some of which will go, a lot of which will go to uh, the states, to uh, INDOT, but uh, a lot of which will be distributed to counties, cities, and towns for their road, run, road funding purposes. Uh, so the first thing, where we get the money, um, and you can see this is a stopgap, we're gonna take some excess reserves. And the idea that there are excess makes me wanna go like that. That right, because it's so contentious. But in this case, it, it, it probably fits. Excess reserves. We're going to take excess reserves out of state balances. And the uh, reserves and state balances at the moment are a little bit more than two billion dollars, or about 15 percent of the uh, of the total budget. So the balances are, are really quite healthy. We're going to take about 400 million dollars out of that, 
and we're going to put it into a matching fund program that for the first time in many, many, many years, they've created a new source of <coughs> formula distribution revenue uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the locals. And it's, uh, uh, it's gonna be called Community Crossings, as I understand. And I kind of like that, just as a sign, I kind of like Community Crossings, because it implies people are gonna be crossing your county. Right? So they were in another county, and then they crossed your county, and now they're in another county. And what that tells me is that it's not just people in your county that want their, your roads to be good, it's the people in the surrounding counties that want your roads to be good too. Which means the people in the surrounding counties have an interest in you maintaining your roads. And so if they've got an interest in you maintaining your roads, maybe they ought to pay for you maintaining the roads. And so what did we do? We took $400 million out of balances, and that money came mostly from sales and income taxes paid by everybody, and we're gonna give it out to all the counties. In a sense, it's a, uh, it's a nice uh, federalist way of uh, paying for local roads uh, with a, uh, with with a state interest uh, and the, the interest of the whole state's public. So that seems to what's going on. Uh, what we're gonna do is say any revenues, uh, any excess reserves, that's anything above 11.5% of the uh, general fund budget, that's made it $411 million. Uh, after that, and so this is a one-time thing, uh, the next year, fiscal year 2017, the excess reserve threshold reverts to 12.5% and anything above 12.5% then goes into pension stabilization. So for this one year, excess reserves are defined as a bigger number and it's gonna go into this matching grant program uh, for uh, local government. Uh, in order to get one of these matching grants, you have to have a local management plan that's approved by NDOT. Uh, it will be a 50-50 match, meaning you've gotta come up with $1 for every $1 they will give you. Where do you get that matching revenue? Um, local motor vehicle excise surtax wheel tax, and we'll talk about uh, that. There's some new changes on that uh, in the 1001 as well. From the Lloyd Special Distribution, that's uh, Senate Rolled Act 67, we'll talk about that. And then from the rainy day fund, and what I understand is, the interpretation on this thing, is that if you raise revenue from some other source, whatever it might be, and decide you want to use that for your match, just dump it into your rainy day fund and it's therefore allowed. Uh, that's convenient. Uh, so they've identified a couple uh, but specific sources for the match, and then they basically said, eh, anything else you got. So, uh, so there you go. Um, here's a, a graph actually going way back, 1976, of Indiana State fund balances as a percentage of the general fund. And you see the little 11 to 0.5 uh, uh, marker over there. Uh, as of the end of 2016, we're expecting to have balances equal to 15% of the state budget. Uh, and, uh, but we'll know here in a month. In a month we'll get the closeout uh, when the budget agency will give us a report on what happened in fiscal year 2016, which has uh, a little less than two weeks to run now. Uh, so we'll know pretty soon what that might be and, and get a better, uh, in fact, an exact number as to how much is going to be transferred uh, into the Community Crossings program. Uh, that'll put us down to 11.5%. You notice I've got up here the rule of thumb minimum and the prudent range. The prudent range is the uh, amount of balances that the budget agency identifies as appropriate, uh, as safe for the state to have. The rule of thumb minimum is, the, the, uh, is what the uh, uh, public finance biz thinks is the absolute rock bottom minimum that the uh, state ought to have in balances. And you can see we've pretty much uh, followed that over uh, the last uh, well, 40 years now. Uh, only one time did we ever get even a little bit below uh, 5%. And so what that says is that we've got about 6.5% balances to handle the problems that come along. That's about a billion dollars, actually. So we've got about a billion dollars in reserve that we could use in case of revenue shortfalls. Um, how big are revenue shortfalls? Well, the revenue shortfalls during the Great Recession averaged about one and a half billion dollars per year. So we've got enough to cover eight or nine months of a really bad recession which we hope doesn't happen, right? So we hope that doesn't happen again. Uh, and really what we've got is enough to cover small shortfalls like we're having this year. A shortfall of however you define it, one-tenth of one percent or four-tenths of one percent. We're falling a little bit short, eh, no problem. We got a billion dollars to handle it. So 11.5, uh, uh, given the state of the economy right now, probably uh, quite all right as far as uh, balances are concerned. Okay, what else are we gonna do? We're gonna take, um, one seventh, or one percentage point in the sales tax, 
of the gasoline use tax and put it into the MVH fund, Motor Vehicle Highway Fund, which is then partially uh, distributed to the county. So what we've done is to identify the part of our 7% sales tax that comes from gasoline and motor fuel. And now we're gonna say we're gonna take one seventh of that and use it for roads. So once again, we're identifying a uh, source of revenue that is tied to road use and we're gonna use it to fund uh, uh, road uh, uh, maintenance and construction. Um, these are gonna go over a few changes. There's gonna be some changes uh, in this. It, it sort of develops over time, uh, but not to go into a whole lot of detail. By uh, 2019, we expect that it'll be 90 to $100 million in additional funding that will be divvied up between uh, NDOT, county, cities, and town. Then there's the excise surtax and wheel tax. And for the first time, again, in a very long time, some changes were made in what can be done with the motor vehicle excise uh, surtax and the wheel tax. Um, again, the county's got to adopt one of these transportation management plans, so it, it, it seems like something that might be worth working on. Uh, legislature really wants you to do it, and they're giving you some carrots here to get you to do it. Uh, they said, well, they, uh, up until now, the surtax rates, that is the rate that you could charge to automobiles, light trucks, and motorcycles, uh, was a maximum of $25 per vehicle, or 10% of what they pay in their motor vehicle excise taxes. Adopt one of these plans, you can raise that to $50, or raise that to 20%. Of course, again, what the legislature has done here is said, well, we didn't want to raise taxes in an election year, but you can. <laughs> so, okay, you can, right? You want home rule? You got home rule here. Uh, uh, wheel tax maximum rate is, moves from $40 to $80. And again, uh, I always say this, uh, and most of I'm sure you know this, uh, the wheel tax is not a tax per wheel, so an 18-wheeler doesn't pay 18 times uh, $40. It's just a tax per vehicle, and it's called wheel tax differentiated uh, from the, uh, the light vehicle uh, surtax. Uh, and the wheel tax uh, applies to heavy vehicles. And so it can go up to $80. If everybody did it, uh, LSA estimates uh, we could raise an extra $183 million by 2018. Uh, okay, so then, then uh -huh, you know, uh, one of the things uh, about the, uh, let me, actually, let me show you the map here first. Uh, there's a map of uh, all the counties that actually have the surtax and wheel tax uh, as of 2016. And the colors up there show when they were adopted. So dark blue uh, was before 2001, and light blue was 2001 to 2008. And the pink and the red are more recent adoptions. And the two gray uh, counties up there, Hamilton and Clark, had it and then rescinded it. So it is possible to do that. Uh, the no data there just means that they don't have it. And it's, it's funny, sometimes when you map things out, uh, you get patterns that you wouldn't notice if you just looked at the table. And the pattern you get here is that the adopting counties run southwest to northeast and that the southeast and northwest corners uh, really don't have anybody. And what that tells me, usually when you see a pattern like that, it means that, gee, the county next door did it, maybe we can do it too. And it just sort of runs, and, and, uh, and as you can see, the, the, the whole thing basically started in the, in the southeast, and it just sort of ran up north, and the most recent uh, uh, folks who adopted there are uh, east, uh, central, and, uh, and uh, north, uh, central. Uh, so, uh, so uh, we've had more adoptions there, but you know, there's only 48 counties that have this thing. And if you take a look think about the other uh, local option taxes that are out there, we got 74 with the hotel motel tax, and we have all 92 with the local option income taxes. So, as a, as local option income tax or local option taxes are concerned, wheel tax, surf tax have been not that popular. Now, why is that? Now, I always figured the reason was is that the county council has to adopt the thing and they have to take the flack for adopting the thing. It doesn't raise that much money. I mean, it's nice, right? It doesn't raise that much money. And then you gotta give half of it to the cities and towns who get it for free without taking any political flack at all. And so you get the cost and the benefit, right? So the benefit is the revenue, the cost is the political uh, heat that you take, and that seemed to be a pretty high cost for a pretty small benefit. What have we got now? Now we've got doubling the revenue that you can raise. Of course, it doubles the heat that you take. If you raise the taxes, but it doubles the revenue, gives you the option, and you can use it in a match. So if you double the revenue, you can get an extra match, which basically triples the revenue. So all of a sudden, the revenue side of this thing looks a little better than it did before. 
And one of the conflicts about wheel taxes and certain taxes has always been you got the county and you got a sizable city. The city wants it and the county doesn't. How does the city get the county to do it? Makes for all sorts of head knocking and bad blood sometimes between counties and cities. Now the cities have their own municipal motor vehicle excise tax. And there it is, they can do it themselves. Any a municipality with 10,000 people or more. Uh, so it's, oh, <laughs> so it's, uh, it's uh, uh, not big, not just big cities, but not little hamlets uh, either. Although I've, I've, you know, uh, I've been in Indiana long enough to know that a city of 7,000 is in fact a city. Uh, and that a little hamlet means you know, 500. Uh, so uh, so 10,000, that's a, that's a serious limit uh, on municipalities. Expanded maximum revenue would be $90 million. And as you can see, wheel tax maximum 40, third tax maximum 25, basically the old uh, rates that you had before. Uh, so really, if you, uh, if you happen to live in a, uh, in, a, in a city that adopts this and the county expands it, uh, you could wind up uh, paying, what, $75 uh, in addition at the license branch uh, on, the, on your uh, car registration. So it could get to, to be significant and noticeable. Uh, but at least now we've got a, 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 a safety valve for the bigger cities and towns that want to have a uh, certain tax, even if the uh, local government doesn't, uh, if the county government doesn't. One more thing I guess I'd like to say, and that is, look at what we try to do with um, road funding. Right? For, for whatever reason, and this is true not just in Indiana, but all over the country, for whatever reason, we think drivers should pay for roads. We think the users should pay for the roads, that, that roads should be paid for with something like a user fee. Right? Because we don't want to put toll roads everywhere and toll booths everywhere. We said, all right, how do we know that drivers are paying? Well, drivers need gasoline to drive on the road, drive the roads, and so we'll attach a tax to gasoline and motor fuel sales. <laughs> Right. Uh, how do we uh, tax them? Well, we know they have to register their vehicles, so we'll add a fee to vehicle registration. Right. That's uh, how we've done it. That's how we've done it. We don't do that for other kinds of spending. In fact, it's unconstitutional to do that for schools. Right. If you tried to charge the parents for the cost of the schools, that would be a violation of free public education, so you couldn't do it for schools. We don't do it for parks. We don't do it for corrections. We do it for universities. <laughs> That's called tuition. We know we do that for universities. Uh, but for most expenditures, we don't do it. Now, you might say, well, it's only fair that drivers pay for the roads. They're the ones who put the, the wear and tear on the roads. But people who don't drive, they benefit from the roads. Right? If you walk to the grocery store, how did the food get there? <laughs> it was a truck that put it in there that drove on the roads. You know, So everybody knows benefit from the roads, but we've decided drivers are going to pay for the roads. So, the legislature has promised to make this an issue coming in, the, in this next session, and uh, that they would try to think of a long-term solution to this problem, because the, the money from the balances, and as I'll show you the money from the local option income tax balances, a $1 billion stopgap one-year thing. Right? So we haven't got a long-term solution to this. They said, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll wait till the election's over, and then we'll really give, give, talk about this. So what are we gonna talk about I think we'll end up trying to figure out how can we get drivers to pay for roads. I notice, oh, I should mention, notice the other thing, right? We say, hey, let's take some money out of sales tax and use it for roads. Just general money out of sales tax? No. We'll identify the sales tax on the gasoline and take that money. Right? So I think what you're going to see is a great big effort to try to find ways to get drivers to pay for roads that overcomes the problem that less and less gasoline and motor fuel is being used in order to drive these vehicles. How will we do it? We've already put a fee on electric vehicle registration. That's, uh, that's extra. Uh, we'll, there was some talk uh, early on that, uh, hey, maybe we can put tolls on the interstate. You have to ask the feds whether we can do that or not. Maybe we could do that. Maybe we can create some new technological thing where where the, your car keeps track of how much it's driven on the roads and they send you a bill every month and the government knows exactly where you are at all times. <laughs> so maybe we won't do that, right? But pretty clearly some really serious thinking is going on about how do we pay for roads given that we want drivers 
to do it. So I think that's where we stand as far as, uh, as road funding is concerned. And obviously the nuts and bolts of the transportation plan and all of that stuff is, is out there still being decided, still being worked out. And I'm not your expert on that one. Uh, okay, uh, local option income taxes. Let's talk a little bit about local option income taxes. Uh, here's what's going on with Indiana personal income. These are growth rates. And uh, as you can see, in the most recent few months, uh, we've been growing in the neighborhood of three to five, maybe five and a half percent uh, per year. So growing pretty well. And this is not inflation adjusted. This is including uh, inflation. But then your budgets aren't inflation adjusted either. So that's, uh, that's the kind of growth that we're getting statewide. Of course, your mileage will vary. And there's a great deal of variation across the state as to whether income is growing or income is not growing. A lot of it depends on whether your population is growing or not growing. Populations mean higher income or more income to tax. One way to figure out what's going on with and uh, what will happen with the next distribution of income taxes is to take a look about what the state forecasts for its own income tax. Because the local income tax and the state income tax are levied on the same tax base. So if we know what the state thinks is going to happen to their income taxes, maybe we get an idea as to what they think might happen to the tax base that you guys tax as well. Uh, well, here is the, uh, uh, the most recent uh, May 2016 uh, tabulation by the State Budget Agency on what's going on with state revenues. And it's a little bit, uh, the numbers are a little bit small, so let me point out the one that you need to have. And that's individual AGI, adjusted gross income, that's the individual income tax. You go all the way to the, uh, uh, to the middle right there, it says 0.4%. And that means that uh, revenues from the income tax are now 0.4% higher than was predicted back in December. So we're meeting expectations and plus a little. But maybe more importantly is the one far to the right over there, which is a comparison at this time last year, that as, as, as of May 2015, where were we? And the increase is 1%, 1%. Now the income tax, the, uh, the uh, personal income number said 25 3% to 5, 5.5%. Why only 1% growth? Now what this says is, what this might say is, hey, actually taxable income is growing rather slowly across the state, in which case the average increase in uh, income tax uh, distributions might be growing slowly as well. But remember, we've had tax cuts. And one of those tax cuts was the decline in the income tax rate. And if you look at the bottom there, there's the individual income tax rates from 2014 to 2018. And in calendar year 2015, the rate went down from 3.4 to 3.3, which is a 2.9% decline. Now, calendar year 2015, the last half of that is the first half of fiscal year 2016, which is this year, which means half of that 2.9% affected state revenues this year. So if you take half of that, about 1.5%, add it to the 1%, you get 2.5%, which is a little bit closer to what we saw on personal income growth. So I'm thinking somewhere in the neighborhood of 2.5%, 3% might be the average increase uh, in uh, uh, income tax revenue, local option income tax revenue across the state. Again, uh, what happens uh, to the uh, individual counties really depends on how your individual county economy and demographics are moving. Uh, okay, what about Senate Enrolled Act 67? This was the other one that dealt with roads, but it did more than that, and so we need to talk about its impact on the local, local option income taxes. Uh, I'm going to take uh, Lloyd Trust Fund balances as of December 31st, 2014, and distribute them to the local unit. I mean, we're going to clear them out, run them down to zero. You might say, now wait a minute, aren't we supposed to have balance? collections actually fall behind distributions. Won't we go negative again and create all of that hassle uh, that we've had in the past? Well, no. Uh, this is, remember, December 31st, 2014. We've had an entire calendar year and then some since then, and we know 2015 was not a recession. And so we know that money accumulated beyond the balances that we had on December 31st, 2014. So we're pretty safe in saying, yeah, we can just clear it out uh, at that point, then take the, the most recent year and a half and say that's our starting point on balances going forward. So they're going to take that. That amounts to a little bit more than $500 million. And they're going to distribute it out to those who uh, buy the formulas on the income taxes 
uh, get to receive it, right? So the counties, the cities, and towns, and if it's Kadget, then the townships and libraries and schools get a little bit as well. Depends on what, uh, what it was for, but it will be uh, divvied out. But the money that goes to the counties and the cities and towns, three quarters of it has to be used for road construction and maintenance. Doesn't matter what you pass the law to do, <laughs> right? Why this issue didn't really come up a whole lot in the legislature, I'm not sure, but the legislature said, hey, here's a pot of money, we need money for roads, we'll take this, we'll give it back to the people who passed the ordinances authorizing the rates and uh, who authorized those rates to be used for particular purposes, but we're gonna tell them they gotta use them for roads. So you gotta use them for roads. Uh, and so 75% of the money uh, is going to the county, cities, and towns, must be spent on roads or placed in the rainy day fund. Uh, that means, uh, by the way, some of that money, or that money itself, could be used for the Community Crossing Grant match, uh, if you want to do that's the other source uh, that can be used. Uh, so that's, uh, that's another pot of money, and if you add the 505 here, and the 400 from the balances, that's $900 million, a few miscellaneous other sources, like the sales tax change, adds in another 100 million, that's the billion dollar stopgap funding. So this is a one-time thing that's gonna be done uh, with the balances. They also made a change that I think is to uh, your advantage and in fact, I think to the, uh, to the uh, public's advantage. And that is they changed the way we decide about special distributions. And as you may know, you've got an account, your local option income tax, or every local option income tax rate you've got, You've got an account at the state where balances accumulate and out of which distributions come. And every once in a while, those balance accumulate, balances accumulate so high that we take that money and we distribute it back. And the question is, under what rules will we use, or what rules will we use for deciding when do we distribute, and when, when do we make those special distributions out to the counties of their local option income tax? And I want to focus in on Elkhart County here. And I'm going to focus in on Elkhart County because Elkhart County has been shown <laughs> in the Great Recession to be the least stable economy in the state of Indiana. Right? Elkhart County uh, motorhomes. Right? That's, that's the basis of their economy. If you think of the first thing that people decide not to buy when a recession comes along, right, durable goods are all vulnerable. You, you say, I'm not going to buy the fridge, I'm not going to buy the couch, might not buy the car. How about that enormous motorhome? Well, maybe we can get by with that, without that, for another summer. <laughs> right? And so what happens when a recession comes along? That industry gets hit hard. And the unemployment rate in Elkhart went up to 20%. And that's why President Obama went to Elkhart uh, to talk about uh, uh, the recession early in his term and why he came back uh, most recently because Elkhart was in depression for a few months at least, um, and really a couple of years if you look at those unemployment rates. Compared to Indiana, Indiana's unemployment rate got up to 11, the U.S. unemployment rate got up to 10, Elkhart's got up to 20. So Elkhart, least stable economy. If we can figure out how much Elkhart needs to have in balances to keep them whole, everybody else ought to be okay. That's the idea, that's the theory behind what we're going to do. But what did happen to Elkhart? Well, just what you'd expect. What we have up there is, uh, is collections. That's the blue line. And you can see the great big decline from about uh, $45 million down to about uh, $35 million. So that's a 20%, 20%, 25% 20 decline in the revenue collections from their income tax. And so you see the big decline there uh, during the recession. Uh, but then you see the, the red dotted line, which is certified in special distributions. You'll notice there was a big P right there in 2008 uh, when the uh, uh, budget agency gave a special distribution, a great big special distribution, essentially cleared out their balances and handed it back uh, to Elkhart County. And the reason they did that is because they didn't know at that point that the recession was going to be as bad as it was and didn't know what was happening to collections. There's always a lag between making the distributions and knowing what the collections actually are. And what that did, because they ran balances down, balances became very negative. Right? Uh, in fact, so by 2010, 15 million more had been distributed in Elkhart income taxes from the state than had actually been collected. And that was a negative balance, and it meant that the distributions had to be dropped below collections for several years 
uh, in order to catch up again. And finally, uh, they did catch up. And they said, all right, what do we have to do to prevent this sort of thing from happening? And you know what happens with, with, with public policy. Something goes wrong because we were a little too generous on this end, so now we're going to be really strict. And so they said, all right, from now on, we're not going to make any distributions until balances equal 50% of the annual distribution that goes out. No special distributions until you got balances of 50%. So what I did, I set up a little spreadsheet model and said, all right, suppose that rule had been in effect during the whole period from 1994 to 2014, and suppose revenues had come in as that blue line, as collections, what would balances and what would distributions have looked like in Elkhart County? And what you see are balances that are really, really big, right? By the time we get to 2014, you've got balances equal to about $24 million and distributions equal to about $50 million, that's about 50%. And while nice, healthy balances make you feel good, they shouldn't become a fetish. <laughs> what, what are balances? Balances is money that people have paid in taxes that are not being used to deliver public services. And so balances, in a sense, are something you don't want. And if you can find a way to keep balances low but still keep yourself in the black, that's probably something you ought to do. You ought to say that the money collected in taxes that people pay in order to support public services probably ought to be actually used for public services or what they're paying for property tax relief should be used for property tax relief. If we've got great big balances, then it's not being used for that purpose. And the legislature, to its credit, recognized that 50% was just too high a threshold and said, how low can we go? Well, they did. They said, all right, suppose we made it 15%. Here's what balances look like in Elkhart if we've been running them at 15% all those years. We get up to the Great Recession, right? we get up to the lowest point, and we're still in the black in Elkhart. Just barely, <laughs> there's probably a couple of sleepless nights in there, right? <laughs> but, but they're there, right? They're there at 15%. So the legislature said, looking at this analysis here, looking at Elkhart, we can set it at 15%. Would have been okay for Elkhart. So what do we got here? We got the least stable county in the worst recession anybody can remember. Future recessions shouldn't be that bad. We hope. And every other county in the state is not as unstable as Elkhart. So everybody else ought to be okay at 15%. That's why they decided on 15%. So a little piece of analysis, actually, that does kind of make sense. And so we're now going to do 15%. What that means is that more of your money is going to be distributed back to you to be used for services and uh, property tax relief. Uh, and we ought to be okay as far as balance is concerned. And we've got some rules that might even be able to be anticipated about when the special distributions are going to arise, right? Not the, not the sort of uh, random occasionally cleaning out balances uh, that we used to do. So we've got a rule. We hope it works. There's reason to think that it will work. Right, I got one more thing to talk about with, uh, with local option income taxes. I know uh, uh, Courtney came by and, and gave you the details about the Lloyd reform. This is a little table that came out of the uh, uh, Legislative Services Agency's um, the fiscal note uh, about the reform when it was passed uh, a couple of years ago now. And uh, basically, as you know, what you're going to do, what we're going to do is combine all of the different income tax rates and how many are there. Uh, depends on how you count, right? There's statutory conceded, so there's three, but then there's all the Lloyd modifications, and I count them out at seven, but then there's all of the special ones for corrections and libraries and other purposes. So I think you can get up to like 13 or something like that. But but it's very complicated, and I've been out there actually talking about local option income taxes my entire career at Purdue starting in 1984. And it's only gotten more and more and more complicated as we move forward. We added, you know, when in 1984 we had just invented COIT, we had Kajit and COIT, and then we invented CEDA. And then in 2007 we added the three more Lloyds. And then, of course, as we go forward, special legislation comes through for all the different kinds. It's incredibly complicated, and I swear it that at least one of those taxes, that property tax replacement thing where you freeze the levy, only nine counties have it. I don't think anybody understands how this works. I don't think the LGF fully understands how it works. 
Certainly, I don't fully understand how it's supposed to work. So the legislature, in its wisdom, and I mean that seriously, said, let's try to fix this thing. So what we're going to do is combine all of the rates into one big rate and then establish a whole bunch of buckets. And the counties will have a whole lot of discretion into what happens to the money into which buckets it will go. Does it go for property tax relief, additional spending, public safety, corrections, other special projects, how much of it goes to the county, how much of it goes to cities, towns, how much of it goes to schools, all through that. I'm going to have a lot of discretion. What that tells me, or at least we'll see, and you would know better than I do on this, I think with the new transparency, and that's really what it is, it's not an attempt to change anything you've ever done, but it's an attempt to describe it in a more transparent way that's easier for the public to understand and the taxpayers to understand, and easier for policymakers to understand as well. I think once this transparent system gets established, we may see a flurry of changes in the way these buckets are, in the percentages of the buckets uh, are, are used. Um, you know, if you want to make those changes now, you've got to rescind one tax and adopt another. Now you're just going to be able to say, well, we need to put 20% over here, let's put 25% over there. That's a much easier thing to do. So I think maybe we'll see a flurry of activity, and, and, and we'll see whether that's true or not. If we do have a flurry of activity, though, there are a number of things that you need to be aware of, and the main thing you need to, or one of the main things you need to be aware of, is that the tax caps, the property tax caps, must be paid attention to, or, or attention must be paid <laughs> to the tax caps. I got an example for you here. It comes out of Clinton County. And what I've done is, uh, is create uh, these two and then two more uh, mock-ups of homeowner tax bills uh, in two different taxing districts in Clinton County, the Jackson Township Taxing District, and then we look at the Frankfurt City Taxing District. And what I did was say, hey, suppose you had a house that's valued gross assessed value of $190,000, which is about double the, uh, the average uh, home value uh, in Jackson Township. But as you may know, higher valued homes are more likely to be eligible for tax cap credits. And so we need a high valued home in order to look at this. And then you subtract the standard deduction and the supplemental deduction and the, the mortgage deduction. And I didn't put all that stuff up there. But what you get is a taxable assessed value after deductions of $91,250. I always look at that and say, look, that's taxable, less than half of the gross. That's how we deliver tax relief to homeowners in Indiana now. We simply don't tax most of the assessed value. District tax rate to low tax rate in Jackson uh, Township, uh, $1.47. The gross tax bill, $13.44. They've got a Lloyd credit rate. So what they've done is take uh, about one half of 1%, 25 of their um, income tax rate, and they're devoting it to property tax relief. And that provides enough money for a tax credit on homesteads of 36%, 36 and a little bit. So the Lloyd credits are $485. Now that $485 is a significant number. It's $485 that the homeowner does not pay in property taxes. And so what we do is we take out of the pot of uh, local option income tax money that comes in, we take $485 and we deliver it to the units of government that have lost the revenue because of that credit. So out of that 485, the schools will get half of it, and there's no town here, so the county will get a third of it, and the library district and the special districts and the township uh, will get the rest of it to make them whole after the credit has been applied. And so that's how we distribute that money when we adopt a, um, a property tax relief income tax. So the tax bill after the Lloyd credits is 859. Tax cap is 1% of the 190,000, which is 1900, but the tax bill at 859 is way lower than that, so we don't have to worry about the tax cap. The tax bill is 1859. What would happen if, now we've got this great transparent system, you say, hey, we don't need to apply that money to property tax relief anymore, let's use it for spendable projects. Let's move it from property tax relief to the general to general operating expenditures. What happens if you do that? Well, that's what the second column says. The Lloyd credit rate drops to zero. The tax bill rises to $1,344, and that $485 is distributed to the local units for additional spending. Instead of using the money for property tax relief, we've used it for spending, and that means there's less property tax relief than there was before. The taxpayer pays a higher value, 1344, 
higher tax bill on their home, and in total, property tax plus local income taxes, more revenue is collected. And so that's the kind of thing you would expect. You would use the money for additional spending instead of uh, for property tax relief. We're going to have more money to spend. You say, well, oh, that's pretty clear. Unless, of course, the homeowner is at their tax caps, and then Tax caps, I like to call them the Rubik's Cube of Indiana finance. It throws a wrench into practically everything that we do. And so you should always think about the tax caps when you do. Now, there are a few counties out there where tax rates are so low that they're essentially operating under the pre-tax cap system. Uh, most counties, though, have at least some taxing districts with rates above two, and when that happens, tax cap considerations start to kick in. So Frankfurt City, same two houses there, same house uh, in Frankfort City. Tax rate for the district, and of course that's the sum of the county and the city and the school and all the other units, $3.66, so a whole lot higher than the $1.47 we saw in the last one. Gross tax bill, $33.40. Lloyd tax credit rate of 36% means $1,205 in Lloyd credits, and the tax bill after the Lloyd credits, $2,135. That is higher than the $1,900 tax cap, which means they get a tax cap credit of $235 and end up paying right at their cap of $1,900. Okay, fine. What about that 1205? That 1205 is handed out to the uh, units that make up that uh, tax rate of 366. So um, the revenue that got lost because that taxpayer did not pay the full uh, tax bill is replaced um, from the local option income tax. Now, what would happen if you did that same maneuver to this homeowner if you said, we're going to take the money out of the uh, uh, property tax relief and we're going to put it into additional spending? The answer is almost nothing happens. Because look what happens to the tax bill. The tax bill goes up to 3340. Right? That revenue, that 1205, is now out there being spent by the local units. The revenue 13, uh, 3340. What's the total tax bill? Well, the tax cap credit went up to 1440, and the taxpayer is still paying that 1900. The previous taxpayer with a lower rate actually paid more. This taxpayer doesn't pay anymore. All we did was replace one kind of tax credit with another kind of tax credit. And so, even though you were using, in an accounting sense, you were using your local option income tax money for property tax relief. When you remove it from property tax relief, nothing happens to the tax bill of the homeowner. What happens to your budget? Well, as far as all the units of government all together, nothing happens to their budget. Right? Instead of the 1205 um, replacing, the, instead of getting the 1205 to replace the property tax uh, that isn't paid uh, because of the credit, you get the 1205 in spendable revenue and the property tax is the same as it was before. But there is an impact here. Right? This is where things get, well, things get. <laughs> um, how are those Lloyd credits distributed? They're distributed to all of the units of uh, government that lost revenue from the credit. The county gets some, the cities and towns get some, the schools get a bunch, because the schools are always a large share of any tax rate. Right? In Frankfurt, probably about 40%. School's going to get 40% of that 1205. If you take that money out of tax relief and put it into a COIT distribution, only the county, the cities, and the towns receive the revenues and the schools are cut out. And so even though the net impact for all local governments summed up is zero, the net impact for the county would be positive. You think the schools will notice? <laughs> Well, they can show up and sign up to speak if they want, right? <laughs> so, so there you go. Um, moral of the story, pay attention to the tax caps. Uh, if you've got uh, a sizable number of taxpayers that are at their caps or above their caps, sometimes property tax thinking gets turned on its head and is completely different from what, uh, what you would ordinarily think. All right, let's talk about farmland assessment. And hey, farmers had a problem. And they went to the legislature, and the legislature said, yes, you do have a problem, and we're going to fix it. And they, in fact, fixed it two years in a row. They fixed it last year, and they fixed it again this year. 
Um, so what do we got? Well, you need to know a little bit. I'm sure there are folks uh, from agriculture here who know about this stuff, but let me give you a brief summary of how we assess farmland. We start with something called the base rate. And the base rate is calculated by the Department of Local Government Finance every year based on all kinds of data like uh, rents, farmland rents, and the yields, corn yield, and soybean yields go into it, how, you know, what are the bushels per acre, a commodity prices, the price of corn, the price of beans, on the farm costs, and then interest rates into the thing too. And just to be technical, it's a capitalization formula. You take the income in the numerator, you take the interest rate in the denominator, you make the division, and that is what the base rate actually is. And it's recalculated uh, every year based on a six-year rolling average of, of, the, uh, uh, of all of this data. And so when 2016 comes along, we add a new year of data and we drop an old year of data. And so that's how it works. And then we have a soil productivity factor, which uh, increases the base rate when the land is particularly good for growing corn and decreases it when the land is not so good for growing corn. And the agronomists have figured this out based on soil type. And then there's an influence factor for some land, which says if your land is flooded most of the time, maybe it's not so good for growing corn, and so we'll subtract uh, from it. If it is a steep grade, if it's covered in trees, uh, influence factors are subtracted off. And that's it. Right? It's uh, really the simplest uh, kind of assessment uh, that we do. And it's all done by, uh, mainly done by this formula that the DLGF announces at the end of every December. They announce a number every December. But well, here's what was happening to the base rate of farmland. It was going up, and it was going up a lot year after year. Now, back in 2007, it was $880 per acre. By 2015, it was $2,050 per acre. And the projection was that it was going to be over $3,000 per acre by 2018. And as this assessed value went up, so did farm taxes. And okay, you could say for a while there, well, the farm economy is doing great. <laughs> There's the price of corn per bushel, right? And you can see uh, that uh, farming can be a gamble. <laughs> but take a look at the peaks of the corn price. This is corn price per bushel. The peaks of the corn price in 2009 and then 2011 through 2014. Right? We got up to $7 and then $8 per bushel. Whereas before, we'd been you know, up and down around three. Uh, well, what was happening? Well, farm incomes were, were going up, right? Farm incomes were going up, and you could say, well, yeah, your taxes are going up, but your incomes are going up too, so you can pay these higher taxes on your higher incomes. And, okay, maybe that's right. And then the corn price dropped, and then the soybean price dropped, and then we were looking forward, and the projections are for $4 corn on into the future, $4 per bushel. And the thing about the, uh, the, if you think about that formula that they used, that six-year rolling average, meant that the old high prices stayed in the calculation for many years after incomes had actually dropped. And so here was the decline in income while, while farm property taxes were going up. So we were looking at about half a decade of rising property taxes and falling income. Squeeze was on. And so um, the uh, farm uh, community uh, went to the legislature and said, uh, This is a real problem for us. Uh, can you do something about this? I'd like to also point out that it was kind of a, and, and again, the phrase perfect storm is, is such an awful cliche by now, but uh, you could have used something like that because not only were farm prices going up, but the interest rate used in the denominator of the calculation was going down because the recession had depressed interest rates and the Federal Reserve had reduced interest rates. So you had the numerator going up, you had the denominator going down. That's why the base rate was rising so rapidly. And you had property prices for everything else being depressed by the recession. So you had this really basically three different reasons why taxes were shifting from everybody else to farmers and the farmers said this is, this is untenable, we can't do. Well, the legislature came in and said uh, last year um, that, oh, okay, here's what we're going to do. We are going to get rid of the whole base rate calculation. No more capitalization formula, no more commodity prices, no more yields, uh, no more interest rates. And we're simply going to allow the base rate to increase 
at the same rate as the maximum levy. We're going to take the ABGQ, the assessed value growth quotient, or the maximum levy growth quotient, which we expect is going to average about 4% per year uh, going forward, uh, and we'll allow farmland assessments to increase at that rate. Well, the formula was already in statute, right? So you just had to pick it up and apply that thing. And the dotted line there was our projection of what would have happened. And this created three problems um, for, for farmers, and just three problems generally. The first problem was, is that constitutional? Um, let me see, objective measures of property wealth tends to mean you use some recognized method of evaluating the value of property Capitalization is one of the recognized methods by the, the IAAO, you know, the, over, the, uh, the research organization, uh, the National Association of Assessment Officers. Um, but using the ABGQ rate is not a recognized method. The ABGQ is a six-year average of Indiana non-farm personal income. And so what we were looking at was having to say, Nothing that ever happens in agriculture again will ever affect the assessed value of farmland. I think the Attorney General wanted to defend that before the Supreme Court. <laughs> if the lawsuit ever came forward, pretty tough, I'd say, pretty tough. Uh, and uh, of course, you know, the Supreme Court will never rule on this thing unless somebody sues. And the, the folks who get harmed by these rules are kind of dispersed across the landscape. <laughs> No big company, uh, like with the black box thing, no big company that will fund a lawyer, so maybe no lawsuit would ever have happened, but pretty clearly a questionable constitutionality. But the Farm Committee wasn't too happy about this either, even though it clearly <laughs> reduced the potential for increasing property taxes, it didn't actually reduce property taxes. Right? It, it changed. Uh, a situation where we were saying to farmers, we're going to increase your taxes a whole hell of a lot. And we change it to, we're going to increase your property taxes just a lot. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much. All right. So, you know, from a policy, you know, this is, this is the classic uh, uh, problem, uh, the way policy analysts think and the way people think. Right? Policy analysts say you compare what you're going to make happen to what would have happened. And real people say you compare what's going to happen to what's happening now. And what's happening, what would have happened would be continued increases in property taxes. And then to top that off, the ABGQ, based on income growth, never declines. Right? To have it decline since it's a six year average of income, you'd have to have at least a three year recession to make the thing go down. And we hope that never happened. It hasn't happened since the Great Depression, right? So we hope that never happened. So it's going to keep increasing, and because eventually the low commodity prices were going to enter the capitalization formula, eventually it was going to peak, and by 2022 we figured the new formula was going to produce higher property taxes for farmers than the old formula. And so we looked at that and said, well, this is, this is you know, thanks, but no thanks, essentially, <laughs> agriculture said. And so here's what we've got, and this new formula is deliciously complicated. <laughs> And I say that because my job and the reason you've got a property tax guy working in the Purdue College of Agriculture is because farmers hate property taxes. And my job, number one, is to understand this and explain it to folks. And the more complicated it is, the more my job security increases. <laughs> so this is, this is really complicated. You did a good job today. Well, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate that. So, but, but, but hold your judgment until we're done with this. What are we gonna do? Okay, we're gonna do two calculations of the base rate. We're gonna do a preliminary base rate calculation just the way we always used to do it. Okay, so we're gonna, and we're gonna take the actual interest rates and they come out of the Chicago Federal Reserve, they tabulate these interest rates, a couple of farm related interest rates, and we're gonna make the calculation. Uh, so we're going to have, you know, uh, uh, prices times yields minus costs in the numerator, and we're going to have an interest rate in the denominator. And then we're going to compare this year, or the, the prospective preliminary base rate for, say, 2017, to the current base rate, which is 2050, $2,050. And if the preliminary base rate is a whole lot higher, more than 10% higher, than the current base rate, we are going to use in the denominator a higher interest rate. So 
We're going to erase the interest rates that we have. We're going to use a higher interest rate. And I think it's, I should, I, boy, I should know this, uh, but it's, I think it's 9. We'll take 9% down in there. And that will bring it down. And in fact, it does bring it down to 1960, right? 1,960. So that's an actual decline in the uh, base rate of farmland for taxes in 2017, down from 2050 to 1960. It's a $90 reduction, about what, 4%. And then we're going to keep doing that. We're going to keep comparing the current uh, base rate to the preliminary base rate calculation. Now, preliminary base rate calculation peaks and then starts to come down. It starts to come down because the lower corn prices and lower bean prices begin to enter into the calculation. And at some point, uh, the uh, preliminary base rate and the actual base rate will be within 10% of one another. And if that's the case, then we'll use an interest rate of, I think it's 7%. Maybe it's 8, 7, 6. This is something I'm going to have to know, so I apologize for not uh, keeping it in my head. But we'll use a middle interest rate then. And if it turns out that the preliminary base rate is actually more than 10% less than the existing base rate, then we will use a lower interest rate in the denominator, which will produce a higher base rate. So think about what we're doing. We are asking our DLGF to use interest rate policy to stabilize farm property taxes. If Ben Bernanke isn't doing anything, we could get him to be the head of DLGF because he's used to using interest rates to try to stabilize something, right? So we've made, we made the DLGF a little, a little Federal Reserve Board there, adjusting interest rates in order to stabilize the thing. But that is what it is. It is a stabilization. Now, I've run a, a simulation, 30-year simulation, saying what would the world have looked like had we been using this formula all along? And in fact, over decades, and I mean 20, 30 years, the average base rate from both formulas are within about 5% of one another. So it really is stabilization. And that's, if it ever went to the Supreme Court, that's, I'm sure, how it would be defended. Right? We, we're using a, an actual recognized method of doing this, of valuing a, a, a this property. Uh, but we're doing it in such a way that it will stabilize and won't have so many big ups and downs. Right now, however, and for the next several years, it will mean a decline in the assessed value of farmland, and that, of course, will affect your budgets and your tax revenue. So let's talk a little bit about how that's going to work. Uh, let me give you this here, uh, and, and you know, this is just the most basic uh, calculation. Levy divided by net assessed value equals the tax rate. If you want to raise the same levy as you always did, but now net assessed value is lower because farmland assessments are lower. And uh, by the way, I should, I should show you. Uh, by uh, 2021 or so, we're down to about 1,400 from 2050 to 1,400. So that's a 25, 30% decline. So it's a significant reduction in that portion of your tax base. So if you got a lot of farmland, you're looking at a decline in that part. Uh, so what happens? Well, if net assessed value goes down and you raise the same levy, the tax rate goes up. And that will shift taxes away from the folks who got the tax, uh, the assessed value reduction, shift taxes away from farmers and towards everybody else whose assessed value didn't change, but who now pay higher rates. Unless, of course, here we go again, unless, of course, those people to whom you are shifting taxes are already at their tax caps. If they're already at their tax caps, then they don't pay more. They just get a tax cap credit. And what happens to that part of the levy that the farmers used to be paying but now cannot be shifted? Revenue loss. You lose. Right? That is revenue losses for counties and cities and towns and schools and everybody else who collects property taxes. So which kinds of counties are most vulnerable? Let's think it through. Uh, if farmland is a large share of your net assessed value, so think about it. Marion County doesn't have anything to worry about. But everybody else has got some farmland. In some places, let's remember, though, that you know, 100 acres of farmland uh, amount to, what, $200,000 in assessed value, which is equivalent of a nice house. Right? So farmland, there can be, I mean, you do drive through, you drive through Indiana, there's a lot of farmland. But relative to even a small housing development, let alone a Subaru factory, it is a small share of the total. So if you've got industry and houses, especially high value houses, 
Even if you've got a lot of farmland, it may be a small share of your total. So take a look at the share, that's what counts. What is the share of farmland in your net assessed value? Uh, but if you've got a large share, then your district tax rates will rise more. Uh, these districts, of course, I mean uh, the sum of the county, cities, towns, school corporations, and so forth, and each of the taxing districts. Those are the rates that your uh, taxpayers actually pay. This would shift taxes to non-farm taxpayers unless those taxpayers are added near their caps. They'll be added near their caps if the district tax rates are high. Now, again, this is not your county tax rate. Your county tax rate is only a piece of the district. It's the district rate that counts the sum total of all of the overlapping governments that the taxpayers pay uh, taxes for. Uh, that's what counts. Right, so you've only got a piece of it. If it's above $2, then your rental housing is uh, at their tax caps. If it's above $3, then a whole lot of your business property is gonna be at, your, uh, at, at their tax caps. If it's above $3, then <laughs> homes valued at less than $100,000 start to become eligible for tax caps and tax cap credit. So if you're above $3, that's the real danger zone right there. That means there's an awful lot of your taxpayer already capped who will not pay that shifted tax from agriculture. So counties with the largest revenue losses are those with a high share of farmland and net assessed value and higher district tax rates. And I guess I can imagine uh, a, a, a county with a lot of farmland and maybe one you know, the county seat with, you know, 5, 10, 15,000 people in it, and it doesn't have that much in the way of business property, and so its tax rate is high, and, that, but, and yet that makes up a large share of your tax base, and so that's where your taxes are going to have to shift, and yet it can't shift there because the tax rates are about $3. That's the kind of place that might see some actual revenue losses. Well, here's a map. This is a map of LSA's estimate, county by county, of the revenue losses from the uh, uh, changes in the assessed value of farmland as of 2019, when we think that the, the uh, base rate will be down into the uh, 15, 16, $100 range. And the green, uh, the loss is less than one-tenth of 1%. One if you look at LSA's chart, and it's in their fiscal note, you'll notice there are actually some positive numbers. How is it possible that a decline in the assessed value of farmland could create additional revenue? And the answer, and this is a, the, the second monkey wrench that gets thrown into everything, the answer is TIF. Not, many, not much farmland in TIF districts, and yet when the tax rate goes up, they get the extra revenue. There'll be a lot of TIF districts uh, in, in the LSA fiscal note, you'll see increases. But that means not very much of a decline. So green, you're okay, you can go get some fruit. Um, <laughs> yellow, 0.1% to 1% loss in, uh, in revenue due to the tax caps. And then the red, more than 1%. And the, the clump of, of red counties is over where we see, I mean, at that area right there, that east central area, Muncie, Newcastle, Connersville, those places right there, stand out a lot in an awful lot of maps that I draw. And that's because, I think that's because, and I'm doing some work on this right now, just trying to sit and figure it out. But I think the reason is that's where the auto industry used to be. Right? That's where the auto industry is. So as that assessed value disappeared, their tax rate went up, and they got clobbered by the tax caps because of those high rates. And yet, there's an awful lot of small and medium-sized towns surrounded by farmland in areas like that. So that's where we see the big losses. Where don't we see the big losses? Oh, Marion Lake, Lake County, very high tax rates, at least in the northern half, but share of farmland in the total, very small. So they don't see very much in losses. On the other hand, you've got, uh, let's pick one out, Park County. Park County also not getting much in the way of losses. Lots of farmland in Park County, but very low tax rates. So the shift will simply take place there and revenue losses will not happen. So there you go, there's your map. Uh, and. Uh, uh, if you see yourself in the red, I, I'm sure it's a sinking feeling right there. Notice that the numbers are not enormous, though. Uh, the biggest loss that LSA estimated, I think, was 5%. I can't remember which uh, county did. 5% is, is fairly significant, but uh, nonetheless, we're, we're talking mostly about small numbers. Uh, but that's where you are. That's where you, that's where you are. Well, that's what I have to say about roads, reserves, and farmland assessment. I always like to advertise 
my Twitter account, my Twitter handle, my Twitter handle is at IntaxRockstars. We had thought of doing Intax Guru, uh, but Rockstars man, that we get to wear the gold domain. You know, so uh, I do this with my extension colleague uh, Tamara Ogle, uh, who's our regional extension educator for local government. So we try to post stuff, uh, we try to post useful stuff, and we kind of post goofy stuff as well. Um, you know, if you're on Twitter, I know you know, you obsessively keep track of how many followers you've got. And we've got 507 right now. We just passed, we just passed 500 on uh, Wednesday when I spoke to the school superintendents. And they pushed us over 500, right? And uh, so we've been on Twitter for about a year and a half, and we've been gaining about three quarters of a follower every day on average. So I calculated at that rate, we will match Justin Bieber in the year 20,000. <laughs> so that ain't gonna happen, but if you are interested in, in uh, our, our posts on local government, we do uh, try to do, actually, you know, Twitter I think gets a bad rap, and, and, and you know, it, it's, it's a lot of fluff. Yes, it's got the Justin Bieber. It gets really nasty, as you know. But there's one little piece of the thing that I found really, really useful, and that is when there's an issue going on out there in real time, the local government reporters will tweet about it. And so if there's something going on in the legislature you wanna follow, likely is not, if it's a controversial issue that makes the papers, your local reporters are tweeting about it and you can follow along what was happening. It's especially fun on election nights and this past uh, election in May, uh, while there was something going on with the president's uh, election, uh, I, I wasn't quite sure, but there were 10 school referenda and I was, <laughs> I was in there for hours on county clerks' sites. And make sure to get your county clerks to post election returns, by the way. <laughs> That's just a great thing. Or, or news sites or, or Facebook accounts or any place I could find reporting on the referendum results. And I actually scooped a couple of reporters on that. On that. So that was cool. That's cool. So, so Twitter, uh, if, you're, if you're interested, if you're into Twitter, we've got one of those accounts. So that's what I've got. Um, time for a few questions. Do we have time? Where are the powers that be? You have one question. into the Constitution, and of course that was uh, Governor Daniels um, uh, baby there, and you know, whatever, whatever happened to that guy? It just sort of disappeared. Uh, somebody wants to run for president, I guess, but uh, anyway. Uh, 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 fine man, a fine man. <laughs> I, 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 I hear you, I hear you, yeah. So uh, anyway, when, when we pass that, uh, the, the tax cap credits and put them in the Constitution, and I still get folks saying to me, so when are we gonna get rid of these tax caps? And the answer is never, right? They are, they, the only reason they're not engraved in stone is we don't do that anymore, right? But they're in the Constitution, they are there, and uh, they pass with 72% of the vote. So um, we put them in there, but 72% but of the public voted for this thing. What did they mean when they voted yes? Did they mean that um, they thought local government was too big and the best way to make it smaller, to get providing fewer services, was to cut off its main revenue source or lessen its main revenue? Did they mean that? Or did they mean, we think local government could be more efficient. We love the services they're providing, but we think they could provide them more efficiently, so let's squeeze them on revenues and see if they can come up with more efficiency. Or did they mean, we love our local government services. We think they're terrifically efficient. We just don't want to pay for it with property taxes. 
let's have some other revenue sources. And the way we get the legislation to authorize those is by cutting back on the property tax. Or did they go into the voting booth, see, oh, a property tax cut, vote yes, and give the other side of the budget no thought whatsoever? One of those four, and probably all of those four. Uh, but the thing is, we haven't had that debate yet, have we? We haven't really had the big debate about how are we supposed to fund local government? How much in services is our local government supposed to deliver? How efficient can local government be? How do we know when they become as efficient as it is absolutely possible for them to be and that any revenue kept below that means loss of services? How do we know all of this stuff? We haven't had that debate yet, but I think with things like what you're talking about happening, at some point this debate's gonna happen. It's gonna have to happen. And I'm encouraged in the sense that uh, uh, one debate that we are have and are gonna have, road funding, came after uh, quite literally decades of agitation on the part of the county association, cities and towns association, and finally uh, NDOT, telling the legislature, look, there's just not enough money for roads. And they, they came around. They gave us, they gave you your own money back. I, I sense I'm riling you up. <laughs> well, the, but they also promised also promised a debate in the next session on the long run solution. And I, well, here's the, if I'm going to rile you up, let me do it this way. They should be held to that, right? They should be held to that. You said you're going to do it, do it. And I think that's, uh, that's, that's where we are uh, on, on local finance. Um, before I, uh, uh, I, I don't see any pitchforks out there before we rile up this debate <laughs> into a mob. Um, any other questions? One more, maybe? Sure. Yes. I think I've asked you these questions many times over the last few years. Well, maybe I'll be able to dance around they're it really, again. They're, they're, really, they're really not questions. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Have at it. <laughs> the question is, why do they keep doing what they do? Uh, you talked about wheel tax. And they, they're, the legislature has tried to push wheel tax down on all counties. Yeah. And some of us have adopted the seat of tax to perform much better yep. for us mm -hmm. than the wheel tax. Yep. Now, why do they want to penalize us by doing some, by withholding something yeah. because we haven't adopted it? Yeah, the wheel tax, as you know, uh, was a, uh, a long running reason not to act on roads, right? You'd come forward, you'd say, hey, we don't have enough roads. Have you got the wheel tax yet? Well, no, uh, it's up to you. And that, that was, uh, I know that was true. Okay, the other, uh, I have three things. All right. Okay. Go ahead. The, the second thing is the use of our gasoline tax. You say we do that to do roads. But how much, and you had the word fencing up there, how much of our gasoline tax is going for fencing and other things that it was not intended to do? Well, uh, the, the one of the reforms they made two or three years ago was to take the state police and the BMV out of <coughs> DMV, out, out of the road distribution formula, and they stuck basically stuck it in the general fund. Uh, and so, almost all of the money that comes in from motor fuel taxes now runs through the MVH and LRNS formulas and gets distributed to some. So uh, that, they, they did hear about that, and that, uh, that was changed. And of course, you know, the other competing interests for the uh, general fund weren't all that excited about now having the state police fully in the general fund budget, meaning there's less money for universities, but uh, yeah, okay, so that's two, all right. All right, that's two. The third one is the cap. And I maintain that I, Yeah. 
Why can't we get that across to the legislature? You know, they've, they've run into it occasionally. Remember the, uh, the uh, governor's effort to eliminate personal property taxes a couple of years ago? Well, it's just the personal property. Yeah. That would kill that, what, Exactly. Remember when the inventory tax was eliminated? Oh, yeah. That the pre-caps taxes yeah. shifted right. and your budgets were not affected. Yeah. Now, if you eliminate what is effectively 15% <laughs> of the tax base, the revenue impact is hundreds of millions of dollars. And it means we can't we do lose, that. In our county, we would lose 25% yeah. yeah. of our assessed value right. if right. we would give up personal property tax on That's right. Property. That's right. So basically, that's the roadblock that that proposal ran into. And the reason we can't eliminate personal property without coming up with some alternative revenue source is because of the tax caps. And the Chamber of Commerce, or the Manufacturing Association, I forget which one it was, recognized that originally, and I think they were a little reticent about putting the caps in the, uh, in the uh, uh, Constitution, uh, because so many uh, folks recognize that if you've got that kind of limitation, what you can do with local government policy is quite restricted. And, and that's the boat we're in right now. So it, it basically, hey, you can't give somebody a property tax break without costing local governments a whole lot of money or finding some alternative revenue source. I have others, but I yeah. <laughs> can do that, uh, and I, I, I keep track of that. Uh, you guys have to do referenda for big capital projects if you if you don't do it with TIF. <laughs> and, uh, but you know, nobody else has the ability to run a referendum to get operating money. The schools do, and we've seen uh, about 65 of these things since 2008, and a little bit more than half of them have passed. Um, and and but. All of the units of government are not allowed to do that. that Maybe. Well, I haven't heard anybody propose that, but the Constitution, the tax cap uh, Constitution says anything passed by referendum is outside the tax caps. And so if you're looking for a proposal, one that's already out there on the ground, maybe you can do that. Now, I got to warn you, only about one third of all school corporations have tried these things. And if you've got a lot of farmland, you're not going to pass it. <laughs> and if you haven't got a whole lot of business property or high-valued homes, the chances of passing are, are less. And so on the school level, I think we are really are headed for an equity problem, urban, suburban versus rural equity problem, urban, suburban having newer facilities and higher paid teachers than rural, not so much. Uh, but uh, I don't think it's severe enough yet to bubble up as an issue. But pretty clearly from the uh, from the referendum results we've seen, that's that's where we're going. Uh, but you know that that could be a thing. I think the libraries have thought of that as a possibility, since they're kind of educational institutions too. Uh, they thought, well, maybe we could get the permission to do operating referenda uh, like the uh, like the schools have. Uh, so that might be a thing. But uh, there's no reason why you couldn't put in statute the ability of counties and other local units to have referenda for various purposes. And well, if you're if your taxpayers give it the okay, it's outside the caps.